Good evening. Good to have you in the house of God with us tonight. Uh, thank you for those who are here in person and those who hopefully will be able to join us on Facebook Live. And, uh, and hopefully they're getting logged on now. And uh, those who will join us later by YouTube and uh, podcast. Uh, I really prefer podcast. Uh, you don't know this, but I go back and I don't always go back and listen to the Bible study, but I go back and listen to myself preach because I want to be a better preacher. And the only way to be a better preacher is to go through the excruciating pain of listening to yourself and saying, you should have done this instead of that. Uh, but that's, uh, I like the podcast because it condenses it down and uh, you don't have uh, as much to listen to. But I appreciate Pastor Jason, all of his uh, skills and abilities uh, to be able to keep us current and keep us uh, on a good uh, media path and able to get the word out. And so uh, I want to just show some appreciation to him tonight. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read verses 4 through 11. Hopefully this sounds familiar to you. Uh, just two weeks ago we started this. And we talked about the first four. Well, we talked about more than that. But we were able to get to the first four uh, gifts of the Spirit that were listed there. And talked about them in some detail. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about them again. Other than to just say what they were. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm trying not to do a whole lot of... of uh, recycling or repeating things that I did a couple of weeks ago uh, because there's plenty of material here. So if you have your Bible, turn to that. Those who are online, if you have your Bible, we encourage you to get that out as well. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Um, I read many different versions and study from many different versions. And uh, so that's, what we're, that's where we're at tonight. Verse 4, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Remember we said it's for each one. For the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom. Through the Spirit, to another, the word of knowledge, through the same Spirit, to another, faith by the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another, the workings of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, to another, different kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one as he wills. So uh, that is, as we read that, that is a listing, and I want you to get this, of some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is not an all-inclusive, but most of the time when people teach or preach, they do at least cover these there are other gifts of the Holy Spirit mentioned in different parts of the scripture. Uh, I think it's important. We are a Pentecostal church. And so we need to understand uh, what the Holy, who the Holy Spirit is, uh, what the Holy Spirit does, and how the church, as a matter of fact, the title of this lesson is the Spirit and the church. We're on part two. Because the Spirit should move in the church. Uh, we shouldn't be uh, waiting on the Holy Spirit to do something. We should be involved actively with the Holy Spirit, especially in worship services, uh, which is many times how the Holy Spirit uh, will move and we'll see the Holy Spirit do different things in church services. So all of you guys sitting here live and in person have seen that, uh, but it is important for us to talk about it and to uh, discuss it. So, a couple of weeks ago, we the word gifts, and to me this was interesting. 
is the word charismata, or many times we look at people and we say, well, they're very charismatic. We're talking about a lively personality. Well, the spirit is a lively person, right? Uh, and he demonstrates himself. Now, notice I'm not saying it because the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity. Uh, and he demonstrates himself and uh, uh, manifests himself in many different ways. So what is a gift? If I was to give you a gift, and you understand this, uh, then did you earn that gift? Did I say you have to do this in order to get that gift? No, a gift is free. It's a grace not based upon merit. And that's what these gifts are all about. You receive these gifts without any merit on your own. Because honestly, do we even deserve ever for the Holy Spirit to move inside of us and live in us? Isn't that amazing? I mean, to me, that's amazing that the Holy Spirit would even do that. So these are extraordinary powers that are distinguish, uh, that distinguish certain Christians and enable them to serve the church. So these, these uh, manifestations and these uh, giftings move through the body of Christ, through individuals, and the purpose of that, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit, but the purpose of that is always to edify and to lift up the body of Christ. And so, uh, God-given abilities and empowerments uh, that work through the individual believers for the common good of the church. Uh, so last, last time we talked about the first four, which were the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the gift of faith, and the gifts of healings, which leaves next the workings of miracles. Uh, in the New King James, it talks about workings of miracles, or King James. Uh, it's both, I want you to notice that both are, are plural, not singular. There are many different workings of miracles, different kinds of miracles. And so uh, we're going to talk about some of them. So what, if I was to ask you, tell me what a miracle is. What is a miracle? Something that can't be explained any other way. That's pretty good. Usually it's instant. Usually instant. Mm -hmm. Happens immediately. So it's not progressive, but it's instantaneous. Something not done with manly knowledge or power. Something, I like that. Not done with manly knowledge or power. Uh, so these are, this is from a textbook. Uh, Acts of supernatural power that change the normal course of nature. So nature would tell us that when we experience this particular thing, this is how it's going to play out. For instance, when the doctor says you have incurable cancer, it's terminal. I mean, we've heard that kind of terminology then the normal course of nature would be that that person would die from that. A miracle would be that that person was cured instantaneously from that. Go back to the doctor and there is verifiable, verifiable evidence that the cancer is gone. That would be a miracle, right? Uh, not to take away from healings. Healings are not instantaneous, right? Uh, miracles are more about uh, something that changed the course of nature. So, what what do these? What are acts of supernatural power? Well, they include power over Satan and over demons. I mean, when you read your Bible, Jesus. When he just walked up, the demons would say, why are you here? Don't cast us out. They would start to tell people who he was because they understood who he was. And he would tell them to be quiet and most of the time cast them out or vanquish them. Uh, so 
They include power over Satan and demons. Uh, they also include power over nature. Okay? What would be an example in the Bible of Jesus or someone uh, uh, demonstrating power over nature through the Holy Spirit? Well, that, that's Old Testament, but yeah, I mean, Red Sea, that's, yeah. When somebody was crippled and he miraculously healed them, they could have walk. Yes. When he walked on the water, that's a good example, right? Uh, yes, raise Lazarus from the dead. What about when he spoke to the storm and it immediately stopped and the wave stopped too? You see, the, the course of nature would be, what is the course of nature? We just had a windstorm. And not a right? drop of rain. And not much rain at all. There's a few little drops in my house, but not many. Uh, but the course of nature would say after a windstorm that the waves are going to continue to lap and continue to, uh, you know, be demonstrated. But when Jesus spoke, it became clear. No more storm, no more waves. That's a demonstration uh, of miracle power over nature. What about when Elijah said it was rain? Absolutely. That's when it happened. It stopped raining. And if you believe what your Bible says, and James, it says he prayed, and it didn't rain. No more. No do. And then he prayed, and it rained. That's that's miracle kind of power, right? So it's supernatural power that changes the normal course of nature. Interestingly to me, and this is not in your questions, although the definition, the short definition for uh, workings of miracles is, and we've said it a couple times, acts of supernatural power that change the normal co course of nature. Uh, interestingly to me, miracles... Uh, the word used there can also be, also be translated, uh, it, it is the Greek word, dunamis, which is power, right? Dynamite power. That's where we get the word dynamite from. So these are supernatural power gift. It is a supernatural power gift. Um, and it does appear that it was one of the marks of an apostle. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 12 says, Truly the signs uh, of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So here's the good news though. Although it seemed to accompany apostles, it was not limited to apostles. Right? What did we say at the very beginning? These gifts are for the whole body and anyone who is filled with God's Spirit who is saved can manifest the, the gift can manifest through them, right? So, it is possible for God to use you to do a miracle. I, I want you to really understand that because I think we often don't believe that. We think it's got to be some super evangelist, some prophet that speaks and you know uh, no God still uses everyday people right and so we, we need to understand that because it is for the body and and, it, and it, it's but it was not restricted to uh, just apostles Acts 8 5 through 7 says then Philip who was Philip he was one of the deacons Right? Diaconus, a servant. That's what that word means. Uh, a worker. So Philip, what does it say he did? He went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Did you know the deacons can preach? They should be able to, right? Uh, and the multitude, so should you. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. Philip. Hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. So here's a deacon, not an apostle, 
but a deacon in the church. Uh, and we see that for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and the lame were healed. So those were workings of miracles by, I shouldn't say by, but through Philip. Right? So that's why I say we, we need to understand and not feel that we are inadequate for God to use us. God can do more through us than we can possibly imagine. How many have experienced God doing more through you than you imagined, right? Uh, and so that's amazing. It is, as we've talked about, distinguished this gifts of miracles. It's different than gifts of healings in that it includes extraordinary demonstrations of God's power apart from miraculous healings. A m miracles can be some of one recovering instantaneously from a disease or sickness, but this is not limited to that, right? Because we talked about some of those things. Uh, <clears throat> exorcism, it's not a word we use very often in the Pentecostal realms, anymore, although it used to be uh, pretty well known and, and seen at times. Uh, even in the Catholic uh, faith, pe priests and different, different people believe in exorcism. Uh, what is that? Getting rid of a demon that has possessed someone, right? Uh, and so I started to ask if you knew somebody, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so uh, the Holy Spirit can use you to do mighty, powerful works. Uh, one of the examples here is that, I don't know if you remember this in your Bible, but I'm going to say Elimus. I, I don't really know how to pronounce his name, but he was a magician. And he was, the judgment of uh, blindness was put upon him. So someone spoke and said, because you've done this, you're going to be blind. And immediately blindness came upon him. So that's another type of example of God's judgment working through the gift of miracles. We don't see a lot of that kind of stuff. Praise God. I, I would not want to cast a judgment and make somebody blind or something like that. That'd be terrible. I'd rather God use me to heal somebody. Amen? Uh, okay. I think because they have the love of God. Yes, yes. We yes. really don't covet that. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to, yeah, we don't want to do that. Uh, and, and, and just because you're right, we do have the love of God. All right. Gift number six in the list here. Like I said, there are more and different gifts. Speaking in tongues. It's the Greek word glossolalia. That's hard to pronounce. It's the Greek word glossolalia. The short definition of that is a divinely inspired utterance. Obviously, all of these are through the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, this is not a human ability to do this. The Holy Spirit moves in us and upon us, and we are able to speak in tongues. Can you repeat that? A divinely inspired utterance, which just means to speak. A saying, an utterance, a, speak, a speech. Um, interestingly, there is a restriction upon speaking in tongues in church. But now I want us to understand this because I don't want the Holy Spirit not to move through tongues and through interpretation. 1 Corinthians 14.23 says this, and, and, you, and we need to really understand this because there are cues in here. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak in tongues and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers will they not say that you are out of your mind 
So, here's what Paul, well, uh, he, he, pro, he doesn't prohibit it for it to happen decently and in order, but what he says should not happen, what, especially when you have unbelievers in the house, is that everybody is speaking in tongues. And everybody, you know, the whole church, rapid fire, <laughs> I don't know how to say that, but rapid fire speaking in tongues and, uh, you know, multiple, multiple times. Can we, I have asked people to pray in tongues, okay? That's different because I want you to pray in your prayer language, not to speak in an unknown tongue that needs to be interpreted, okay? So, there is a prayer language of tongues, but there's also a tongue that needs to be interpreted. And how do we know the difference? It's like with me, huh? I'm fired shut, my phone, I know I'm supposed to do that. Okay, so there's a testimony inside of us, right? That says, that's what, it's kind of what you're saying. It's, it's a fire shut up in you. You know you have to give this. Uh, it, and it's not just your normal prayer language of speaking in tongues. But it's like, oh wow, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to bust if this doesn't kind of come out. Right? I mean, this, we're just talking normal feelings. That's kind of, I've experienced that before. Um, how does the congregation know? I'm getting very, I'm, I'm getting very um, down to earth in this. How does the congregation understand that this is a tongue that should be interpreted? I don't know that the whole congregation does, <laughs> but I do know it's an awe that comes upon them. Okay. There's an awe that comes upon that congregation like that. when the gift of tongues is, is being given. So there's a knowing and an awe. In other words, there is a reverence and an understanding God is about to speak, right? Or has spoken, and now there needs to be an interpretation, right? Now, there's no prescribed, there's, I've not seen ever anything in writing to tell, tell us when we know that. But again, it's a kind of a testimony or an understanding the Spirit testifies to us to say, we need to wait on this. It's not just somebody praising God in their heavenly language. But God needs and wants to speak. Right? So the prohibition, in other words, don't do this, is for everyone to speak in tongues. Rapid fire, if you would, with no interpretation. So. That'd be a lot of confusion. It would. And that's the why. That's why he said, they're going to think you're out of your mind. And if you do that. And, and, God, and God, as Carol's absolutely right. And that's a perfect scripture for here. God is not the author of confusion. And so uh, that's why. Not because there's... Uh, what, can I tell you, Paul says, I wish you all spoke in tongues as much as I do. He says that. But he's not talking necessarily about the tongue that needs to be interpreted, but about his prayer language and his praise language and his language that he uses to pray... One, one deep tonight. To pray whenever uh, you don't know how to pray. Right? That's what the whole... I, I literally, I have... Uh, I, I like to pray up here. I walk around. Sometimes I walk through the aisles and every once in a while, uh, the Holy Spirit will say, such and such sits here. You know it. Pray for him. I'll do that. But then there comes sometimes an urge upon me to pray in tongues that I don't know what I'm praying about. And guess what? I probably don't need to know what I'm praying. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And let me encourage you. Boy, I'm going into this deeper than I thought I would. Let me encourage you. When, when, yes, we are. When we pray in the Spirit like that, and we don't understand what we're praying about, and we're speaking uh, to the Lord and, and the heavenlies, I believe the heavenlies are moving and changing because we are calling things out. Uh, and we're speaking in faith in the Spirit. When, when, you, when, you, when you stop doing that, just say, I agree with that. 
Amen, Holy Spirit. Because you don't know what you prayed, but you're going to, you want to come into agreement with what the Holy Spirit has prayed through you. And so uh, that's really interesting. Um, how many knows that speaking in tongues is controllable? Sometimes when unbelievers or even people of just different backgrounds and denominations come into a Pentecostal service and setting, uh, they, they think we're out of control. Like, they're, they're just, you know, speaking and, you know, in tongues. And, and it seems to them, I'm not saying we are, I'm saying to them it seems uncontrollable. But 1 Corinthians 14, I'm still in that chapter. Thank you, Carol. Uh, you were there. Verse 32 and 33 says, And the spirit of the prophet are subject, the spirits of the prophet, the prophet are subject to the prophet. For God, and here there's the verse that you quoted, For God is not the author of confusion, but of the opposite, of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So, what does this say? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you to, for you to speak in tongues? That means you've got, you, you got to be talking to God and have Him. Yes. <laughs> you want to know what to do. Yes, and, and we can control when we speak in tongues and when we do not. That is not an uncontrollable thing. Uh, and... Uh, and, and I'm not saying this because anybody's done this. And I don't think anybody in this group has ever done this. But there are times when we need to wait. And we need uh, to, for it to be a, a moment. And God will. If, if it's a tongue that needs to be interpreted, God will make that opportunity. I mean, know that, that will happen. You Sometimes you get that urge and you're like, oh man, I feel like I need to give this. But the scene and the setting, the Holy Spirit saying, not yet. But then whenever... It, it seems the Holy Spirit always makes a way. And then things kind of settle down, and then there's an opportunity to speak that tongue that the Lord has given to you. So, uh, it is controllable. You're not in a trance. You're not in a... You're just being... You're allowing the Holy Spirit to control your tongue. Right? Sometimes so, you can over-control. Huh? Sometimes you can over-control. You can. Sometimes, yeah. Don't do the opposite. Don't say, oh, I don't know if I should. And the Holy Spirit has obviously made an opportunity within the service to minister to the body. And then you kind of clamp up and, mm, I don't know if I should do that. There, you can do the extremes there. Uh, all right, so... When it is given publicly, and we know the difference between, like I said, a prayer language, the tongue needs to be interpreted. That's a need within the body. When it is not, I mean, I've been in a service when a tongue is given and it's not interpreted. I have. I've seen it many times. Um, let me just put a little plug in here. Maybe the interpreter wasn't in church that morning. I'm, I'm not saying it's their fault. I'm saying uh, sometimes there's people new who haven't been, haven't been used that way and they're nervous and just won't do it. That's understandable, isn't it? I mean, uh, we resist the Holy Spirit sometimes. Now, hopefully we don't do it to the point of being, you know, sinning in that. But how many, I know Linda, uh, not that way, but I know that Linda has said, well, Lord, if that's you, you have somebody else go up there and pray for those. But no, the Holy Spirit was telling you to go up and pray for somebody, right? And you didn't do it, right? But somebody else did. So God, uh, but... Then I got mad. So verse 10, who wants to read verse 10? Of chapter 12. King James says diverse kinds of tongues. Old English. New King James says different kinds of tongues. What does that mean? There's more than one. There's more than one. 
Can we name a couple types of tongues? I believe there's at least two types of tongues. Well, that's true. You have a heavenly prayer language. Uh, so this, this, <clears throat> what, what else is this talking about? How many? I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I have not, but I've read many multiple stories of this happening, of someone being in a church service that was from a different country. Somebody gave a tongue, and it was their native human language. That's one type of tongue. Right? Yes, Carol, there is a, a heavenly prayer language. Uh, the second kind is, uh, it's actually interesting, uh, the Bible in one place calls it like the tongues of angels. What's it saying? It's a heavenly language. Right? Unknown to man, but known to God. Right? So those are different kinds of tongues. Now, are there others? I, I don't know. Uh, but there are at least those. Right? Intercessory. Intercessory Where tongue. The Holy Spirit prays for you. When, when, yes. when you don't know what to say, kind of thing. Yes, yes. Um, um, In the early days of sending missionaries to foreign countries, they would gather around them and they would pray over them and they would ask the Holy Spirit to, to give them the ability to speak in that foreign human language. And God did it multiple times. Isn't that powerful? It's amazing. Right, I think I don't know that I've ever known exactly uh, like I've heard people speak of Buford being one, mm -hmm. and I knew his tongue was Indian, Native American. Sounded like an Indian yes, language. He did. Yes. And then I've heard people uh, that I thought they were speaking Spanish too, and they weren't Hispanic. You know. Right. So. I, I, I've heard uh, some that sound almost Chinese or Asian in nature. Um, <laughs> so and they might, uh, you know, it's dependent upon who is God trying to speak to, right? Uh, so anyway, very interesting. Uh, we'll come if, if at the end we'll come back for some more uh, discussion or questions if you have it. So if there is a tongue, there needs to be an interpretation of tongues. So what is what is a short definition of interpretation of tongues? Of course, translator. Yeah, that, that's a good, very short. Um, so obviously all of these are spirit given. But the ability to understand and communicate the meaning of a message that is spoken in tongues. It's important that we understand that it's not just the ability to communicate it. But the ability to understand it, especially. Have, have you ever heard a tongue? And the tongue was fairly lengthy. But then the interpretation was short. Not it didn't sound like it was as lengthy lengthy as the tongue. I mean, have you experienced that? I've experienced that. I've seen that. Does that mean that they were wrong? No, it doesn't. So why could that be? There's a couple different explanations. So if the here's why I said it's the ability to understand and communicate this message that was given to Thomas. Because what it could be is that the interpretation that is given is more of an explanation or a paraphrase of the tongue and not a direct translation. Interpretation does not have to be a direct translation in order to be an interpretation. Right? Understand that. It's you are simply communicating the understanding. This is what God said, but God doesn't it's the cliff notes where I like that. Uh, God doesn't, you don't open up your mouth and God forcefully speak through you with his voice. He's using your mind and your mouth to speak 
and to make it understandable to the people who are there in the service. I've heard a very short uh, tongue and a lengthier interpretation. There could be multiple reasons why uh, that happens. Do you think it might depend on the individual too, Brian? I mean, yes, I, uh, I, I I'm can convinced. Say how I might get the lift here one because I'm a doctor. Somebody right. Somebody else, you know. Right. We have a doctor too. <laughs> you don't mind me like me. <laughs> so, so God uses us, our natural abilities or personalities to speak this uh, and so somebody might be able to say it real short but then somebody else would go into more explanation and greater detail and add uh, uh, more uh, adverbs to it and you know what I'm saying people just speak differently right I mean what we have to understand is there is a human factor in both the giving of the tongue and the interpretation of the tongue. All right? I believe that there, there's still a human factor. All of these gifts of the Holy Spirit, they're not operating through a robot. They're operating through a human. Right? Because we are human, we can miss it. Uh, and hopefully we would recognize that as a body. And maybe, and hopefully not point out, oh, that was wrong to that person, but give grace and mercy. And then I believe God will, I mean, I've been in services where there was a tongue interpretation and then another interpretation. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say what's going on there because I'm not 100% sure, but there's a human factor in all of this, right? Brian, a uh, secular analogy of that would be when I used to have to send a letter out to staff at work. Mm -hmm. If you send one letter, send the same thing to five different people, you're going to get five different interpretations. You will. You will. Said. You will. So then, uh, and that's why God is very uh, specific about giving an interpretation to someone. This is the one that needs to give that so that the receivers hear it. And can I tell you that a tongue and interpretation can be given and you will center on one part of that interpretation and somebody else, and the Holy Spirit's helping me with all of this, uh, the, somebody else will center on another. Why? Because that's the part of it that they needed to, right? And so uh, this, this is good. This is a really good discussion. Uh, how many of you ever in school, even if it was a hundred years ago. No, I don't want a hundred years ago. <laughs> I'm joking. How many of you in school, even if it was a long time ago, ever studied a foreign language? Learn how to speak a little bit. Okay. I studied French. Uh, I wish I had studied Spanish. It would have been more helpful in this community. But if you've ever studied a foreign language, you will understand that a literal word-for-word -word translation sometimes is very difficult and very confusing. Because from one language to another, sometimes it does not literally translate. You get the idea, but not the literal. That's why I said earlier that an interpretation does not have to be a literal translation of that. Okay? So, I'm glad I didn't confuse anybody in saying that. <laughs> um, so, the overarching purpose of all of these spiritual gifts, and this is in your questions, I'm just rehearsing it, the overarching purpose of a spiritual gift in a worship service is to edify the body of believers. It's always the purpose to edify the body. Now, sometimes that edification might come in the form of correction. Okay? That still edifies the body. Sometimes we don't like to be 
told, oh, you shouldn't be doing this. This is not right. But it still edifies the body, right? Because correction, how, aren't you glad your parents corrected you when you were growing up? Because otherwise you'd be a spoiled brat, right? And you might have hurt yourself and done things you shouldn't have done because your parents said, don't do that no more. Right? They did it because they loved you and the, the Lord does the same thing. You right. want to as a body for the Lord to say, you're doing good. Yeah. Keep it up. Keep Do more. You know, what you know, do you want? The, you want the Holy Spirit to do that. I am a person who is motivated by praise somewhat. All of us. And we like praise. I'm also sometimes motivated by a little bit of correction. But if you get too heavy on the correction side, I might cut you off, right? So the Lord knows what we need, right? He understands what we need. Uh, so, 1 Corinthians 12, 22. I'm going to just read it, and then I'm going to say uh, it, it's in your questions. Therefore, tongues are for a sign. So tongues are a sign. Not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. So a tongue is a sign to an unbeliever. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. So tongues is a sign for an unbeliever. Prophecy is given for the believer. Right? And that's what the word says, right? That that's that's what it's for. Why would a tongue be a sign for a non-believer? Yeah, like the day of Pentecost, right. when when they're all sing, uh, uh, not singing, they're all they might have done some singing, but they were all praising God and speaking of His marvelous and wonderful works in their languages, although they knew they were from Galilee. So that's certainly a sign to an unbeliever. So the gift is designed to get the attention of the unbeliever, right? Uh, does that mean that just because they like, oh, that, that must be of God, does that mean they instantly are going to believe? Not everybody, but it's pretty powerful. Day of Pentecost, it was very powerful, right? 3,000 people, like, Whoa. And while Peter did a great job preaching, I don't think it was just Peter's preaching that convinced the people, right? And he did a good job, better than I could preach, but it wasn't just... That was also the sign to the unbeliever. I think that was miraculous in itself. I do too. I do too. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says, Therefore, let him who speaks in, tongue, in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Um, when you give a tongue, you should pray to interpret it. That doesn't mean that you will always be the one to interpret it. But that, how do I say that? At the least, if no one else does, and you've been obedient to the point of giving the tongue, and I don't know how to say this, your tongue has been loosed by the Holy Spirit, then pray for Him to give you the interpretation too. It doesn't mean you have to give it. Sometimes you'll get the tongue and know the interpretation and the Holy Spirit will use someone else to give it and then you go to them and say that was exactly what the Lord was saying. And what's that called? It's confirmation. Right? I've, I've had that happen so many times. Mostly to the point, I rarely give an interpretation. But I've had it happen so many times that as it's being given, the Lord, the Lord's speaking into my mind and saying this is what I'm telling the people. This is what I'm getting ready to tell the people. Now, they'll speak it differently than I would, but it's the same message, right? So, uh, that's just going through things about speaking in tongues. How many are ready to shift gears to prophecy? Prophecy can be either a gift or a ministry, okay? 
And there is a difference. And we're tonight going to talk primarily about the gift of the Holy Spirit of prophesying, prophecy. But you have to distinguish between those two. The gift is a temporary or momentary expression of God's Spirit. Okay? Uh, I, I'm, that's, I, I'm just explaining. I'm, that's not a definition at this point. Okay? So it's temporary or momentary. God moves upon a person with this gift to prophesy. Everyone who prophesies is not a prophet. Does not hold the office of a prophet. Okay? Uh, and this is stuff I couldn't get into with the whole church. But this is good teaching. Okay? I'm not, not cussing me. The Holy Spirit's helping. So you have the ministry gift uh, of prophecy. And it's to a particular person who functions as a prophet within a, in the church on an ongoing basis. That's the ministry of a prophet. The gift of the prophet, which is mentioned in chapter 12 here, verse 10, is a periodic manifestation of God's spirit that is potentially available to every spirit-filled Christian. Let me stop right here before I give you a definition. Occasionally, God will have me prophesy to someone. Sometimes, while I'm in the midst of pastor teaching, preacher teaching, you know, God... Uh, I believe almost every pastor has the gift of pastor and teacher. Okay? Some form. Okay? Sometimes I'll stop in the middle of ministering and I'll say, I, I, I'm, I'm going to prophesy this over you. Okay? That is a tip. I'm not, I'm not usurping and saying I am a prophet. What I'm saying is the Holy Spirit has moved upon me to give you a prophetic word. How do you judge a prophecy? Does it come to pass? Right? That's why we should be, even though I believe the gift of prophecy can be upon anyone, we need to be careful when we say, I'm, saying, I'm not saying don't say it, because you know when the Lord speaks to you, but be careful not to say that everything the Lord said. Okay? Uh, because that's important. It's important. For us to not, you know, for us to know that the Lord said. Okay, so let's let's define prophecy as a gift. It is the ability to deliver a message or revelation directly from God. We've said what prophecy is. Prophecy is not the delivery of a previously prepared sermon. It is a message directly from God for the moment. There's a difference in preaching and prophesying. Right? Although God can use us to go flow back and forth between gifts. We've talked about that a little bit in this. Sometimes we'll come, we'll, we'll, we'll flow in and out of gifts during a service. But why? For the edification of the body. Right? Uh, so that, that's important. Um, a prophecy gift of prophecy here is what I'm talking about the message doesn't always do these but the message may expose the spiritual condition of a person it may offer guidance it may offer comfort that was comforting to those people and challenge their faith uh it may be a warning. It may be a judgment. See, prophecy is used in, uh, the gift is used in many different ways. Um, and as I've said before, prophecy is one of those gifts that we need to test the authenticity and truth of it. I remember Brother McKinley saying this so clearly. Don't allow a prophet to tell you this is what God has said if the Holy Spirit has not already been dealing with you about that, then you need to judge it for its authenticity and its truth. Not saying that that prophet would intentionally tell you something false, but this, this operates through the human, right? Uh, although there are false prophets, and there will be people 
that purposefully manipulate people and saying they're prophesying to them. Okay? So we, we have to we have to understand that. Uh, so uh, so we need to test the truth of it. I remember somebody giving a message to a young girl and told her and it was very much a judgment. And she walked away just very confused, very upset. And our pastor's wife went to her and said, Honey, they missed it. That's not all at all your character or your nature. Brush it off. It was not of God. Okay? So that can happen. Hopefully it doesn't happen, you know, a lot. And uh, I knew this gentleman who spoke over her, and the whole time he's saying it, I'm a young person, not a pastor, not yet called to the ministry, and I'm sitting there thinking, is he talking to the right person? I mean, seriously, I'm thinking, he, man, he missed that. So it is possible to, even for a child of God, to miss it. He may have very well felt like this was the right person to give this message to, but I tell you, he missed it. Right? Um, you don't know if it's right or not because you weren't there. But anyway. Um, I had been there on occasion, but I absolutely knew that the person had it right just because I knew the individual and I knew them well. Yeah. Here's a mark of one of the marks of a true prophet is that they don't mind to be judged. Last one, distinguishing of spirits. You rarely hear people talk about this, but it is important. Let me give you the definition. The ability to discern whether the influence, and this is a long, this is a long definition, whether the influence is the Holy Spirit, a demonic spirit, or the human spirit. Let me know that we blame a lot of things on God, and it was just, or, or on the devil, and it was us, right? It was our thinking that got in the way sometimes. All right. So, um, examples in the Bible Ananias and Sapphira. Remember, they lied? And the Bible says they lied through the Holy Spirit. And Peter, wasn't it? Called them out? I can't remember now. It's been a long time since I read that. Anyway, they were it was Peter. They were called out and the Holy Spirit judged. I mean, two dead people. Boom, boom. Right? Like, wow. Uh, so uh, that was a distinguished, that was a lying spirit. Where was that influence? It wasn't the Holy Spirit. It could have been a demonic spirit of lying, or it could have just been the human spirit that said, we want to get all this glory for giving this money, and everybody's going to think we gave it all to the church, but instead we held back some of it. There's nothing wrong with holding back some of it, but they lied. Right? And when we deal uh, with people, the Holy Spirit will talk to us. If we're in tune with the Holy Spirit, He'll talk to us. And He'll say, that's just their bad thinking, or... That's that's the devil working through them. Or, yes, that was of God. That's how the Holy Spirit will communicate to you uh, and distinguish between spirits. Pretty much spelled them out as we went along. So I'm just going to go ahead and give them. For the sake of those who are listening online and for you here, the name of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit mentioned in this chapter. It's not all the gifts of the Holy Spirit mentioned in this chapter. Chapter. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healings, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. That's all the ones that we've talked about now. A short definition of the working of miracles are acts of supernatural power that change the normal course of nature. A short definition of speaking in tongues is a divinely inspired utterance. Short definition of an interpretation of tongues 
is the ability to understand and communicate the meaning of a message spoken in tongues. Question five, short definition of prophecy, the ability to deliver a message or revelation directly from God. Question six, the short definition of distinguishing of spirits is the ability to discern whether the influence is the Holy Spirit, the demonic spirit, or the human spirit. Question seven, the main purpose for the operation of the gifts in the spirit of a worship service is to edify the body of believers. Question eight, Tongues is a sign for unbelievers, while prophecy is for believers. Question 9. The prophetic message must be tested for authenticity.